So the Hail Mary strategy allows people to take normally abnormal risks, big, in fact, prefer big risks because the big payoff at the end, winning the game, dominates the downside, which is just another interception. My guest today is William Silber. Bill is the former Marcus Nadler Professor of Economics and Finance at New York University Stern School of Business, a three-time winner of the Professor of the Year Award at Stern, and is currently a senior advisor at Cornerstone Research. He is also a best-selling author and has written eight books about financial history and monetary economics. His latest book is The Power of Nothing, The Hail Mary Effects in Politics, War, and Business. I recently sat down with Bill and talked about what happens when people find themselves in situations where there is a big upside and limited downside, how it triggers gambling behavior like a Hail Mary and can lead to terrible decision making. Bill, thanks so much for being on the show. I greatly appreciate it and I really enjoyed your book. The name of the book is The Power of Nothing to Lose, The Hail Mary Effect in Politics, War and Business. Thanks so much, Bill. It is my pleasure to be here, Charles. Okay, Bill, I didn't know until we spoke uh, last week that you and I might have crossed paths close to 40 years ago on the floor of the New York Futures Exchange. That is correct. I was a professor at NYU, and I had done a whole bunch of research on how market makers make a living. I was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, and I went to the trading room, to Bankers Trust trading room where half my students were, and I sat down and watched what they did. And finally, I said, I think I can make a living doing the same thing. So uh, when the New York Futures Exchange opened, I think it was 1982. That's right, it was. So uh, I took my $15,000, which was close to my entire net worth at the time. And I said, let me go down there and see if I can trade. And I quickly learned I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> until some guy said, hey, listen, don't think you know which way the market is going. What you have to do is quote a bid and an offer and let it live for about 12 or 13 seconds, buy at your bid, sell at your offer. And if you can't do that, just let the trade go away, wash the trade. And once I decided, once I learned not to think, I knew which way the market was going, I made a nice living. Yeah, that's great, man, that's great. Um... I uh, uh, probably that same guy spoke to you also spoke to me, but um, uh, at the time I think we both um, cleared it. Uh, Goldberg Brothers at the time. It's that's uh, correct. Goldberg yeah. Brothers, which was a big a big clearing firm on Chicago Board of Trade. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. When did yeah, you leave? Came in, when did you leave? You left. You said in eighty two May eighty two. I left. Uh, I started right within a month when the futures exchange started. With the when knife started. And then uh, about a year later, I went to Comex and then to um, the uh, New York Merck, where I mm -hmm. traded in, at Comex, I traded gold right. and gold options. And on the Merck, I traded crude oil options. All right. So because uh, I, I remember, I think I was down there in May of 82 is when I started. So maybe you. Yeah, well, we, we definitely crossed paths. Right. We might have been yelling at each all other. All right. Could be. Maybe I maybe I definitely hit your bid one day. But all right. Could be. Um, Who knows? I would have liked <laughs> you. If you hit my bid, I, I would have liked you. Hey, you said you made a nice living, and I definitely was not a great floor trader when I got there. That's for sure. All right. Bill, The you put together a book about the Hail Mary effect. So before we go on any further, what is, in a nutshell, the Hail Mary effect? Well, almost every American uh, knows the Hail Mary, even if they never watch a football game. My wife knows about the Hail Mary, and she never watches football. Uh, we know uh, at the end of a football game, uh, and I use Aaron Rodgers because he's quite famous for uh, the Hail Mary pass. At the end of a football game, when the Green Bay Packers are losing by uh, less than a touchdown, and they're, for example, on the 50-yard line, and there's no chance that they can 
uh, th that they can uh, uh, get a touchdown in a normal way. Uh, what Aaron Rodgers does is gets in the huddle and says, everybody run into the end zone and I'm going to throw a pass and hopefully one of you people will catch what has now become known as the Hail Mary pass. It became known as a Hail Mary pass in the early 70s with Roger Staubach. Roger Staubach was a quarterback for the Chicago, for the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. And, you know, in one of the playoffs games, he, uh, he was losing and they threw a pass into the end zone and Drew Pearson caught it. And they, the, the, the reporters gathered around at the end of the game and said, well, what happened? So well, I got into the huddle and uh, I threw a pass and I got knocked down and I said a few Hail Marys mm -hmm. and uh, it became an American icon of an act of desperation that uh, allowed someone to be to take what is normally a an unthinkable risk. Um, Aaron Rodgers and Roger Staubach didn't throw the ball up in the air. They didn't like to get intercepted. But at the end of the game, they had what I call downside protection. What does downside protection mean? They're going to lose anyway. So, so what if they have an interception? It's meaningless. The big upside is they can win the game. So the Hail Mary strategy allows people to take normally abnormal risks. Big, in fact, prefer big risks because the big payoff at the end, winning the game, dominates the downside, which is just another interception. Right. So basically, you just described an option, which is an asymmetrical bet or a lottery ticket where you have minimum downside, buy a lottery ticket for a dollar, and your maximum upside is a zillion dollars if it hits. And if it doesn't, you would never do that with your whole paycheck, but you're doing it with a small amount because the risks are so against you. And really, what's the worst that could happen? I lose a dollar. Uh, perfect, Charles. You, uh, uh, you read the book and uh, you understood it better than I did mm. when I started, actually. Uh, the way this got started, of course, was part of a class that I was teaching on investments. You know, how do you choose between stocks, bonds, real estate, and so on? And then I wanted to introduce options, which is normally a very tough topic. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of math. Mm -hmm. So I designed a fun contest. And this was after the students are all beaten up with all the math. So I designed a contest which said, Look here, guys, I'm going to give you a list of 10 stocks, bonds. I said, you know, IBM back then, and I said crude oil and, and treasury bonds and so on. I'll give you a list of 10. If you pick the winner, the one that had the biggest profit at the end of the semester, you're going to get one and a half points added to your final grade. And if you pick the loser, nothing happens. Nothing, except you get sympathy. So the question is, how should you choose? Well, most students, you know, they think they know something. So they say, I think this, I think that. They guess. You know and I know guessing is a very bad strategy. But there is an optimal way to approach this. And that is you look at the asset, which is the riskiest. The one that, what's riskiest? Biggest upside and biggest downside like crude oil back then, like Bitcoin today. Why do you choose the riskiest? Well, the upside gives you one and a half. The downside costs you nothing. The payoff is skewed. Big upside, one and a half points. Zero downside. Therefore, the optimal strategy is the riskiest security. And of course, you know, and all your listeners know that this is why the premium on an option with the biggest volatility of the underlying asset is the biggest. It's attractive because right. you get upside without downside. Right. Okay. Let's not even get into 
deltas, gammas, betas, and all things options. Because I, I forgot I, everything just, you just said. Uh, okay, outstanding, good. So let's let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. When the chips are down and you have nothing to lose, people behave in a way that they wouldn't behave on a regular Monday morning. Agreed? Perfect. Perfect okay. way of saying it succinctly. Okay, excellent. That's why they pay me the bucks. By the way, one thing when uh, my kids were in school and they would have these stock market tests, uh, stock market contests, where over X period of time you pick a stock and you win and they give you a certificate or something, they always used to come and say, Dad, you do this for a living. You manage money. You know stock. Give me a stock. And I refuse to ever give them stocks. I said, this is encouraging terrible behavior. I said, why? And then I started to explain them stocks are pieces of a business. We don't buy that. They didn't want to hear any of that. But my point was these so-called contests basically encourage behavior that in the real world we could lose you a fortune because you're going to go for the maximum upside without any care of the downside, and you're playing a game literally of how to get the most in the shortest amount of time. So it teaches you nothing. It'll teach you nothing about stock. As you mentioned with your, with the example, if I was in a contest today of picking in, in your class, I'd pick Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the other small ones because those are the ones that could move 30, 40% a week. What's my downside? So what did it teach me? It taught me to take risks. You're, you're absolutely right. And in fact, I tell a story uh, in this book about a, a contest that TD Ameritrade uh, holds among all college students and had four, 500 uh, teams. And the team that won in 2015 chose the riskiest portfolio. Why? They said, well, look, biggest upside, it's the risk. Downside, who cares if we lose money? Right. So it's a bad, a bad lesson for investment. However, it is a good lesson for things that have optionality, have skewed payoffs, because when you have a skewed payoff, like at the end of a game, okay, like the end of a football game, I'll give you another sports example. It's not just the end of a football game. When a batter has a three and O count in baseball, what does the manager sometimes do? Gives the batter the green light. What's the green light? You have the option to swing at the next pitch, but you don't have to. Mike Trout, who was a three-time MVP winner, says, when I get up there and it's 3-0 and and I get the green light, what do I do? I swing as hard as I can. Why is that? I want to belt it out of the park. And what's the downside? A strike. So behavior, when you are confronted with that skewed payoff, gives you the, the, the best strategy is to choose the riskiest outcome. And if all of the costs of the downside are borne by you, there's no problem. The big problem of this occurs when there is collateral damage because others bear the costs of your ready reckless behavior right. and there are many instances in history mm -hmm. where that has caused huge destructive okay. effects so let's talk about huge destructive effects because at the end of this conversation bill you, we're going to discuss how to harness this or we're going to try to discuss how to harness this when it could, should be used and when it shouldn't be used. Because if you don't know the difference, you could cause a hell of a lot of trouble. Now, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. Most investment banks were getting paid by producing these instruments of mass destruction, these derivatives that they manufactured for investors for institutions for what have you got paid a huge amount of commission and when it blew up there was no damage to the person who put it together he got paid his commission he was probably out of there by then 
And it almost took down the financial markets. Took down the whole, what well, my financial markets, took down the whole financial systems when the risk for the individual was zero. So I want to formulate a question on that. How, especially when dealing with other people's money, what type of circuit breakers can you put in that you don't put people in such a tempting position that heads they win, tails they win a little less. You want them to have heads they win, tails they lose. All right, so Charles, let, let me broaden that just a little bit, and we'll come back, of course, to, you, to your basic question. If you look at a trader for any bank, whether it's an investment bank or a commercial bank. Now, those two, do, two are very, are the, the, the distinctions are, are almost non-existent. But if you look at a trader for a bank, the trader normally has uh, a small salary and also gets a bonus. A bonus for doing what? Earning a big profit for the bank. This produces the same identical skewed payoff that we're talking about. Why? Because if the trader puts on a risky position and then there is a big up, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, run up in the asset that he or she bought, he gets a big bonus. Oh, but what happens if the stock price or the asset goes down? Well, he loses money, but he never has to repay the bank for the losses. Okay, so 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 so, so let me ask you. Let me ask you, Bill. How right. do you prevent that? How that we know this, right? We know that when you put people in a position where they get enormous reward for the hail mary pass. And there is no repercussions. Well, sometimes there are. The guy might get fired, but then he'll go get another job somewhere else. That's perfect. Okay. Exactly right. Okay. So now, how, what sort of deterrence do you put into this that prevents this type of behavior because it, cre- it creates a reckless environment? It could create the collateral damage you mentioned, such as it brought down, they almost brought down the financial system in in uh, 2008, and how it will rear its ugly head again when we keep when we keep offering these type of incentives. Tell me how to put the brakes on this. Okay, so let me give you the first line of defense. Okay, the first line of defense is the company itself, the bank itself, knows that traders are incentivized to take big risks because they have this asymmetric payoff. So they don't just let any old jerk sit at the sit at a at a at a trading desk and do whatever they want. They'll be bankrupted before that before they turn around. So they monitor. Management always has the incentive to monitor their traders to do what? Take prudent risks. When you are about to lose too much money, take the position off. So banks themselves want to stay in business. And if they want to stay in business, they're going to monitor their traders. Okay. So let me, let me stop you right there. So, so, sure. so the first, first thing you're basically telling me is pretty common sense, which every, every institution that gives people discretion to trade money in capital markets has a system of monitoring the risks. We've seen the way this doesn't work at times, and most of the time it doesn't work, especially if that particular trader happens to be a tremendous earner because you close your eyes to it. So the the monitoring, (laughs) you know, look, look, by the way, monitoring in for whatchamacallit, we had a few weeks ago on the show, Jim Campbell, he wrote the book, Madoff Talks. He was the guy who had access to, to Bernie Madoff, Ponzi scheme, emperor. No one ever did what this man did. And he was monitored by so many, and especially, which uh, Jim Campbell spoke much about, J.P. Morgan. 
They were the guys handling these assets. And if they just would have checked, they would have seen it wasn't possible. Yet, since Bernie was pro tr providing so many, so much fees for the bank, there were internal memos saying, lay off the guy. So there, what happens when that monitoring, the incentive to make more money for the institution gets in the way? All right, so let, let, me, let me say that, the, I mean, again, broaden it just a little bit. The, <laughs> the bank could surely monitor <clears throat> as deeply as it wants, as much as it wants. It could cut you off. Do not take that position. What's the problem? The problem is the bank itself likes the upside, doesn't want the downside, but it will indulge a great trader. It will indulge a great trader to capture the upside. And it believes it can monitor the downside, even though there are occasions, maybe many occasions, where it can't. So, or it can't, or, or won't do it, or gets caught before it's able to monitor. And by the way, this has undone many, many, I mean, Barings, a 200-year-old bank that, uh, that uh, helped Thomas Jefferson uh, finance the Louisiana Purchase. It was undone by a rogue trader, Nick Leeson, in 1995. And that's because they, they monitored, but they liked his profits too much and therefore were slack and let it get out of hand. Okay, so so what, how do you solve that problem? <clears throat> okay, so there are, there is one, there are two, two solutions. One, you can tell bank management, listen, if you, if you lose mo more money than your total capital this year, we're gonna put the CEO in, to, to, in, in jail for 20 years. So if in fact you did that, I guarantee you, the CEO would put in place a manager on the uh, 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 government bond trading desk, on the proprietary trading desk, which would in fact monitor. Or the CEO would say, guess what, guys? No more proprietary trading. The only thing you can do is quote bids and offers, and you better go flat. Flat means what? No position at the end of the day. If you punish the CEOs enough, I guarantee you, they will find a way to be effective monitors. Okay, maybe that works in Disneyland, but in real world, tell me how we're going to do it. Well, in the real world, because con Congress will never pass a law which will put uh, CEOs in jail for 20 years if they lose too much money, they sometimes have the guts to pass a law which says banks are forbidden from proprietary trading. Which is the Volcker rule. And they did that. They did okay. that in the under the Volcker rule. Yeah. And then the you, Volcker then you, rule says banks, let me finish. Banks can't do can't do proprietary trading. Well, does that mean proprietary trading disappears? The answer is no. It goes to an unregulated sector where everybody knows the risks, like hedge funds. So you push the really dangerous trading to an area where, ready, there is both upside and downside. The people who put their money into hedge funds and the hedge Bill Wang, who uh, managed Artegos, you know, lost the family jewels, okay? And now, you know, he, he also caused uh, big uh, losses at major banks that lent him money, that lent him money, and they, in fact, suffered the consequences right. of wanting the upside. Okay, let me, let me just interrupt you a second, so just, sure. to, just to get our listeners. He was a trader who lost $20 billion uh, in a heartbeat. I think it was his own wealth. Not, I think anyone, uh, not to, I'm sorry, not of his own wealth. He lost $20 billion in a, in a pretty short span of time. I think it was a couple of days or so. Yes. A couple yes, of days. Yes, correct. Probably one of the most amounts of money because he was going to banks 
and borrowing money from banks. So banks were on the hook because they wanted this guy's business because they make money on fees and on interest and so on and so forth and indulged him even more while his bets on the market did not pay off. They got caught holding the bag. And here's what's amazing, Bill. As you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. This was not the first time he burned people. This was the second time he burned people. He's got a history of doing it. But the incentive on behalf of institutions to make more money overrides rational thinking. Well, that is why there was a, all I can say is the, the Volk luck. I wrote a biography of Paul Volcker and I was around when he was talking to Congress about the Volcker rule. And in fact, when it was passed, there was screaming and yelling, this is un-American, this is un-American. How could you let this happen? And his answer, and you know, I, I thought at the time, believe it or not, that it was overkill. I thought it was, you can't let them do anything. The answer is push it to a sector that is not subsidized by the government. Right, that if it blows up, okay, but gotcha. But here's my point. I hear what you're saying and I totally am with you in theory. By the way, Paul Volcker, didn't his son go to um, NYU where you taught? He was, yes, he was in my class. There you go, okay, good. Uh, so, uh, hope he gave him a good mark, man. You know, his dad's Paul Volcker. No, nah, he didn't do so well, but go Oh, ahead. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Paul Volcker's a big guy. What's he, 6'7 or so? Six, six, six. Yeah, he's, he is a big guy. Oh. But you know what? He doesn't interfere. He says, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta stand on your own two feet. Wow. Wow. I just would, I just, wow. That's your son, professor. Thank God. Well, thank I only went to college for about a couple of months, but all right. So uh, definitely not in more. <laughs> I went to Brooklyn college for about a year. That's a good school. Go yeah, ahead. I, I didn't stay. I used to sit there and listen to the, and this was in the, in 79, 80, when inflation was running rampant, stagflation was crazy. And a professor was sitting there in our lecture hall speaking about how the economy should change. And I said to myself, what am I doing in this class? Listening to some guy who is a professor who's not doing this but talking theory. Let me go around the real world. That's, then, I went, then I went to start trading. And I realized everything I learned went out the window. But okay, put that all aside. That was, a, I digressed. I'm not going to so, hold any of that against you, Charles. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't have to, especially with the tuition NYU charges today. So here's, here's, here's my thoughts on that. Here's my thoughts. When... When you do that, when you push it to an unregulated area of the market, you make it not your problem, right? It's not my problem. Well, it's not, it wouldn't bring down the system. Is that what you're trying to tell me by moving That's it? That's correct. Okay. It won't bring down the okay. system because, look, l l let me just interject right here. What's the problem? The problem is that a sector like the banking system that has what, that, that has a claim on central on the central bank and a claim on the government to remain in business because they are ready the essential to everything so that industry is subsidized by a put in other words if things are really bad the government is going to come in and bail you out if the government is going to come in and bail you out it has the right to prevent you from doing things that will cause big bailout bills. On the other hand, if we push that all into the hedge fund industry and the people who invest in hedge funds know full well they can lose everything and the hedge fund monitors know they can lose everything, the damage, I don't say is zero. I didn't say it was zero, but it won't have as big a bill for taxpayer bailouts. Okay, let me stop you there, Bill. 1990, you did. 19, you did. You me. 1998, long-term capital. This was professionals. This was the smartest people in the room. And just for our, our listeners, long-term capital, fantastic book by Lowenstein is called When Genius Failed. Highly recommended. It's about 150 pages. Give you an education on how when smart, brilliant people do stupid things. So you won't feel that bad. Here you had, I think, more brain power, more a higher IQ than any place in the world. You had a couple of PhDs sitting there. 
Uh, these were, and you had you had traders and managers there who worked at Solomon Brothers, who had who were not in the men's clothes business. They were in this business. They start this new company, manage, and at one point they leverage two fifty to one, two hundred fifty to one, where they are inches away from taking down the financial system. And if it wasn't for the, I think it was the Fed at the New York Fed getting them all in a room and closing the door amongst the investment banks, they worked this out. The system was in peril. So now, let me circle back. You just told me, uh, Paul Volcker told you, rather. let's go to Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker basically said, okay, let's move the problem away from where it's subsidized, in a sense, by the taxpayer, by the U.S. government, and put it in a place where if it blows up, eh, rich people lose money. But that re- in reality, it doesn't happen that way. Well, when you say in reality, it doesn't happen that way, in point of fact, there were no there were no federal funds used to bail out because long-term ca- because there were no you agree there were agree. no federal funds to bail out long term capital it was all the the major banks bailed them out Be- ready hold it I'm not saying anything because it was in their, their best interests. interest. Fine. To make long-term <laughs> capital not destroy the entire financial system. Okay, but my point is this. If the Fed didn't hold a gun to their head and say, you guys work this out and lock the door. And, and by the way, uh, 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 Jimmy Kane of Bear Stearns was the only guy who held out. Bear Stearns did not pony up. And they got paid back in 2008 when they were asking for money. Everyone just slammed the door on them. So Wall Street has a long memory. So they got kicked in the ass for what they did back in 98 when they should have been bailed out. I'm, let's move aside for a second. If the Fed didn't lock them all in a room and say, you guys work this out, the blank could have hit the fan in a huge way. The point that I'm trying to make is this, Bill. How the heck do we get so close to the cliff, look over into the abyss, and all of a sudden get pushed back by chance, which breeds moral hazard because we saw in 2008, they thought the same thing. Don't worry, we can work this all out. And it brought down the system. I have a one-word answer. Go leverage okay so now Lever- le- 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 let me just let me just say now nah, i did not nah, i said a one word answer but then of course there's a little commentary <laughs> one word with a, with a paragraph attached that's right leverage is the answer and that means leverage kills when people are <laughs> induced because it's other people's money to take big risks. It's the same principle. When you are highly leveraged, if you get, if you have a big, if you have a big positive outcome, you get to keep it all. When you have a negative outcome, you declare bankruptcy. I'm not saying, and no one is saying, and it's never possible to reduce the risks to zero. It is not possible as long, unless, you outlaw leverage. If you outlaw leverage, if you make sure that no one is leveraged, you will never have this kind of a problem. Leverage produces an incentive to take risks. It's done in corporate America. It's done in financial institutions. Leverage kills. Of course, what's the attraction of leverage? Ah, big leverage allows me to get big returns when I'm right. So you can outlaw leverage. And of course, there are guidelines for leverage. There are guidelines for leverage among financial institutions that have this claim on government resources. And presumably, stockholders worry about highly leveraged business. There are all sorts of clauses in debt uh, financing, which prevent doing things that are uh, uh, not in the interest of, of the sure, holders. Right. But mm-hmm. none of that eliminates eliminates every risk. As soon as you have leverage, you have a an incentive. You you have the skewed payoff. You have a skewed payoff with an incentive to take on big risks which is why investors must monitor 
companies that are highly leveraged. Okay. Monitoring will be incomplete, but you have to be aware that leverage is dangerous. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't think you go far enough here, and I want to tell you why. If you have a board of directors, I'm, I'm a shareholder of a company. Board of directors are there to make sure that the president, the CEO of the company, they're, 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 the, they're the representative of the shareholder in the boardroom. They should be monitoring the CEO to make sure he doesn't do anything stupid or she doesn't do anything stupid or that can put the company out of business. So what do the board of directors do? They give incentives to the CEO uh, in order to be reckless at times. For example, as Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner says, if you want to find the crook, look for the incentive. So if you're going to compensate the guy based on increase in revenue growth, guess where the guess where all the the, the, all, all, the, all the, the cheating is going to take care of. It's going to be their uh, phantom sales. It's just the nature of people. And I could go on and on. If you want to do it in earnings, you have this. Okay, here's my suggestion. It's not really my say. It's Warren Buffett's suggestion. I want to hear how you, how do you, resp- how you respond to this. Because you live both in the world of academia and in the real financial world. Those board of directors who get 150, I think it's now $250,000 to show for four meetings a year, smile, vote the way of the CEO, CEO appoints them, you, it, you can't get a better job. Can't be, just keep your mouth shut. I, I, mean, I forgot who said it, but someone said, the last time uh, they invited me, the, they, when they invited me to the board, the board, that was the last thing they ever asked me. <laughs> so that, that's it. You just sit there and you give a yes vote. It's, it's literally voting in the Soviet Union back in the day. How about... If a company does something reckless and puts and destroys shareholder value to such an extent where it can be determined that it was reckless by giving the CEO license to do ABC or what AOL did or Times Warner did when the AOL merger destroyed shareholder value. Other than take the board of directors out and shoot them, you bankrupt each one of them. How much... How much of that do you think would go on in terms of taking crazy, insane risks if that was above the heads of the board of directors? Well, you you didn't like when I said, give him a 20-year jail term. You you didn't like when I said that. But that would do it. Give give every member, instead of the CEO, a a a, a um, 20-year jail sentence. Put all the board of directors in jail. Oh, you say, oh, bankrupt them. Look, I mean, I, you have to do whatever it is. Are you ready? And this is an important point from the book. You get collateral damage when the perpetrator doesn't bear all of the costs. And that is what puts the limited downside. If you impose costs on the downside, you say bankrupted, I say put him in jail. I said it before, you didn't like it, but now you've come, ready, halfway, <laughs> only halfway. You wanna bankrupt them, I wanna put him in jail. No, I, I think I tell you why, I tell you why. But no, 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 let me finish, because I want the payoffs not to be skewed when there is, ready, Huge collateral damage. Okay, so let's say I want to take Huge him. I want to take him out and shoot him. Damage. I want to take him out and shoot him. So how about that? So, it, but this, so we were now in the middle. No, so wait, wait, I, between I think, shooting, I, hold it. Between shooting and bankrupt is twenty years okay. in jail. See, I, I think the jail thing. I think the jail thing's hard. It's it's harder. It's hard to do because really. How are you going to prove they broke a law? And you're going to make up your own laws and someone always come out. I, I'm with you. I, I, let me put that aside. Let me not debate that for a second. We have financial okay. penalties. Financial penalties put people in jail. Yeah. If you are guilty of fraud, hold it. If you are guilty of fraud, you go to jail. But this is not if, fraud. If, this is bad judgment. This is bad judgment. Bad judgment's not fraud. You went looking the to, other. What is looking the other way? Now, nah, Bill. What Bill, is looking the other way? To 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 to, to prove fraud, it's a lot harder. Uh, I understand. Uh, okay, that. so now here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying, and and I know we're, we're we're theoretically discussing to try to we're making the same point. We're trying to see. We're trying to discuss what incentive could you put in there that curtails bad behavior. And we could Correct. joke. We could joke all about it. Shoot them. Uh, bankrupt them. But the point. The, the point is, we both agree 
When there is zero, you create the Hail Mary effect. And that's what your book is talking about. If you put people in the situation of the Hail Mary, I'm going to give you a, a perfect example. If you have a school where cheating is punished by sitting in detention for a half hour, you just created a moral hazard. You just created reckless behavior because the upside is I get a higher mark, I could go to Harvard. The downside is I spent a half hour in detention. Perfect. Expel the guy. Like in West Point, if you're caught cheating, you're expelled. And it's put on, and you're just out of the service. You never overcome that. I don't know what cheating is in West Point, but I think they had some ring recently. Uh, thing. It's, it's something. So I think what we're doing here, I think what we're doing here, I think what, what your book does in a very, very well laid out, well thought out way is identify the problem. I think your next book, Bill, I think your next book, uh, some ideas on how to rein in this problem. Because this book, in a sense, you, it's, it's phenomenal. Because in a very clear cut, folks, I want to tell you, I read this in one sitting. Two things I like about Bill's writing. It's, he great, tells great stories. You're a great storyteller. I can listen to you all day. He footnotes everything. Everything here is footnoted. So I look back and I said, get the heck out of here. And I said, holy smokes. The guy said, and I went on the internet and I found some of these things. And I said, I can't believe it. And it leaves me wanting more stories. So this is great as a case study. But we, I think you'll do a tremendous service to the financial community. And for people in general, is if you could come up with some type of, other than shooting people, which was my idea, in order to take, how to, how, how to, how to, how to minimize or blunt the Hail Mary effect. Can I give you one reference in the book? that is fairly controversial, but there's a chapter on uh, suicide bombers. And in the chapter on suicide bombers, my ans one answer to deterring suicide bombers is, ready? Give them something to lose. Give them something to lose that they care about. And I'm not going to go in th through the entire discussion, but one of the examples I give is when the Israeli government destroys the home of someone who, of a family who is uh, a, a suicide bomber. And the international outcry is collective punishment. You have to then make a judgment about, do you want to discourage suicide bombers? The only way to discourage it is to give them something to lose. And you say, well, would destroying the home of their, of their parents discourage them? And my answer is, I don't know for sure, but I do know something, they care about what their families think. They care about damage caused to their families. So it is not outrageous, an outrageous practice to destroy the family homes. It is precisely along those lines that we are talking about in the financial system. But this, I say, so you ask me, why don't I write, write a book? I have a chapter in there which deals precisely with this question and draws on examples from the U.S. prison system where, uh, where prisoners who are in jail for life do not have nothing to lose which would make them be extra violent. Why is that? They have something to lose, namely, uh, you know, uh, air conditioned cells and so on and so forth. You give them privileges. Well, these are the antidotes, the antidotes to try to ready internalize the collateral damage and eliminate the incentive to take big risks because of the skewed outcome, changing the skew. All right. So bankrupting uh, CEOs and board of directors is kind of tit for tat. Uh, here are people who love money, are in it for the game to make money. You heard them reverse. By the way, with the, with the, um, 
with the Israelis, I asked a friend of mine who uh, comes from Syria, uh, came recently, and I go, what is, is that a real deterrent? And he says, you don't realize in the, in the um, Arab world, owning a home is a sign of pride. Being homeless is a very big shame. So when the suicide, it wasn't so much that they cared about their parents, which they may or may not have, uh, you, know, uh, uh, um, you know, sleeping with 72 virgins might have overcome that, but uh, it, uh, causing your parents shame, which is the exact opposite of what suicide bombers are doing. They want to be martyred and they make streets out of them in, in, in Palestinian territories in Gaza. By destroying their home, you're basically shaming the family. And that was a very big deterrent. It worked. It absolutely worked. I, I, look, I, 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 I promoted that argument, and there are many suicide bombers who tape messages to their families saying that they are bringing honor. Right. But right. if you eliminate their home, that's a call. I don't say it will eliminate everything, but we're trying to reduce the incentives given by mm -hmm. the skewed payoff. Right. Right. No, no, I'm definitely with you. I'm definitely with you on that. So, so um, you know, I think in the business world, uh, especially when you're dealing with the too big to fail and uh, what we went through, and, and the problem is, is we're going to have something every 10 to 15 years because that's the memory of people who were sitting on the desk now that they were 40 or 50 and they're retiring now at 65. You have a whole bunch who never knew what, the, what, the, what 08 or 05 was. You know, now that we're 12, 13, 15 years away from it. So they totally forgot it. All those old timers moved on. You have a whole bunch of new guys who think markets only go up and you never have any type of have a risk. So you're going to keep having this. But, but I think that it's, it, I don't think, I know it's just a matter of time before it manifests itself uh, in another uh, shock to the system, which hopefully we can recover from because it, it's not, it, it, the deterrence really hasn't been there. Charles, I'm going to use a cliche. I haven't used a cliche the whole time because I worry about them. Mm. But the cliche that you, there is, this is why history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. People's memories are short. Yeah, yeah, we keep going over the, uh, the same thing again. You know, history is, 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 is not, for, you, don't, you don't just don't remember it because it's convenient not to remember it. So, uh, you know, look, I, I don't think, uh, you, you look, let me get back to this. Your book does bring up, and, and I didn't do it uh, justice, but we're running out of time, but your book deals with, and I just want to go through a couple of these uh, quickly, about lame duck presidents. Now that you uh, people have heard what type of skewed results there are, you know, upside, which is asymmetrical upside, and downside, you really have limited risk. Lame duck presidents, second term, you outline how Woodrow Wilson got us into World War, II, World War I because there was no downside. Uh, um, asylum seekers, Rosa Parks even, no downside, huge upside. Adolf Hitler in the Battle of the Bulge, military, all of these things. I, I think you did a tremendous service to uh, not only the business community, I think anyone who studies um, behavioral finance or anything dealing with how people act during certain situations. Because I think if you see what these are, even with our kids, if, the, if you're caught uh, um, you know, speeding, you don't pay off the ticket or ground them for a week. You take, or what they do with, with, uh, with uh, I think the New York, uh, New York um, City was doing, where if you were caught DUI, driving under the influence, they impounded your car. That's a tremendous, uh, you know, that's, it's no longer you just go to court, pay a fine or probably may, maybe get jail time. You lose your car. That was a pretty big deal. I don't know how that worked. Do you have any? Uh, no, any but it, it's all about flattening the flattening the skew. The, yeah, I, I yeah, mean, that's all it you really is. You got to flatten the skew in order to get people to internalize the collateral damage. It's no longer collateral; it belongs to you. That will incentivize you to behave. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy, and it's not foolproof. But that's the way you have to think. Yeah, you know, humans are pretty clever, and they will always figure a way out to either move the risk somewhere else where you can't see it or get around uh, certain guardrails that you put up. Uh, because uh, someone who wants to do mischievous behavior or take under risks will figure it out. 
You know, it's 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 not the it's not the good people that you have to worry about. It's those outliers that'll just blow up any system. You know, it's uh, the whale trader with uh, J.P. Morgan losing, I don't know how many billions of dollars on that. Nobody knew about that either. Uh, I remember when I when I when I and you also when you were trading at Gold uh, Goldberg Brothers, uh, every day we had a P and L. And I remember one time I was using too much leverage. They had a clerk come down in the middle of the trading session. I think it was that twelve thirty spot. Tap me on the shoulder and says. My 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 uh quote my my call sign was Miz M I Z Miz get off the floor until you put up more money and that was it my trades were frozen I just can't understand when you have uh when it measures and this was a couple hundred dollars when it measures in the billions of dollars the the safeguards there are just it just it just doesn't register how bells and whistles are not going off I agree with everything you said. Yeah. I wish I could have, uh, if you want me to fight with you now, you're going to have to pay me extra. No, I, I, I really, you know, honestly, I really don't because it, it just, it just, uh, look, the, as long as you have human beings involved and we don't have straight algorithms cutting things off or cutting, you know, turning the lights out, you're going to have this type of behavior. The question is uh, it, the integrity of the people you deal with. Uh, as you know, Warren Buffett says, you can't make a good deal with a bad guy. So if you hire people who are risk takers by nature who have something in their past uh, that would promote this type of all or nothing strategy, you have to avoid them. You have to avoid them because you put these type of people in situations, I'm not saying blame or anything, but it's really, really hard. It's really hard uh, to, to uh, monitor them and, and stamp it down, especially when a guy has to pay for, I don't know, his sick kid who needs a kidney. And here he is at a trading desk and he could risk money. All right, I'll give it a shot. What do we get to lose? I get fired. Upside is, <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. The answer, part of the answer is punishment, but also to not promote uh, reckless behavior by providing the wrong incentives to begin with. Oh, yeah. So there's, yeah. there, there's a, it's the wrong incentives. Yeah, and we, we send kids to college with the incentive to get good marks. So therefore, where are you going to find the cheating and the plagiarism and getting good marks? Right, so if we took away all the marks and it learned, and college was for for knowledge's sake, those those behaviors wouldn't manifest. You know, it's it's so many times we put the stumbling block uh, before the blind person, and we say, "Go ahead." You know, it, it just it seems uh, I wouldn't say unfair because that's 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 making a judgment call. It seems that you're not giving these people a chance. They're doomed to fail. They're doomed to fail. That's just my take. I'm going to let you have the last word on that, Bill. Uh, the last word is watch out when you see people with skewed outcomes. And if you have to, if you see them, you had better watch out for the, the collateral damage. You know, I, I had before uh, this morning, or was it this morning or yesterday, I was telling a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, that I'm interviewing you today about the book of the power of nothing to lose and the Hail Mary effect. Because you know, I want to tell you something. There was a guy in our industry, I'm not going to mention the industry, it was the garment industry, but I'm not going to tell you more than that, where they paid the salesman based on sales. So you could imagine how much money this person made and how many of those sales not only were at times dubious, but uh, sold at a loss. And he won because you said you're paying me on sales. So the incentive was not to make money for the company. The incentive was to write orders. And the company, I think, went out of business. They well, lost millions. Well, there's, there's one other, there's one. It's the credit department that you need to have reining him in. You don't sell to someone. The credit department. I want to have an import. I want to pay the, the manager of the credit department the most money in my business. Yeah. Because that's the guy that's going to save me. And then he goes to the CEO, and the CEO goes, you know what? He's running a lot of business. We can't piss him off. And back uh, to square one. Then, then the credit <laughs> department guy says, you know what? You're not paying me enough money because you're not paying attention to me. I hear you. So it's a never-ending uh, cycle of how to figure this out. And I think it boils down to you got to hire the right people, and you got to make sure that the incentives are there. But they're not the wrong incentives that are going to get, a, get to encourage reckless behavior, which is a very fine line, very fine line. Um, you know, we're not going to come up with a solution today, but, uh, but I, I love the fact the way you pointed out in so many different things. 
It was a pleasure. Bill, thank you so much. The name of the book, folks, is The Power of Nothing to Lose. Go out and get it. It's a quick read. You'd really enjoy it. Bill is a great, great storyteller, and uh, you could see them in your own lives, your own business, the way you raise your kids, the businesses you might have, or any incentive that you see pop up. You could First thing you should be asking is, how can this destroy me? Because if it doesn't today, it will eventually do so tomorrow if you don't have the proper guardrails in place. Bill, thanks so much. I greatly appreciate it, Ben. Pleasure. I enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.